All right, guys, listen, no. ladies, uh, let me just get, get, let me get five minutes of your time while we're finishing up here. Today's video was brought to us by Mantis. The Mantis family of products is integral to ASP staff building handgun and carbine skills and are your most economical and fastest path to improvement in your skills too. Whether you choose the X10, the Laser Academy, the Blackbeard, or use them all in concert, they will help your practice be more effective, efficient, and fun. Go check them out, pick up a unit, and thank them for sponsoring today's video. To talk to you about the things that we have not had a chance to really focus on here, okay? So we talked about church safety, and I know everybody wants to talk about the active killer problem. It's a very simple problem. Do you know where he is? The answer is no, what do you do? Find him. Find him. The answer is yes, what do you do? Kill him. Kill him. Kill him. Get him down. Simple as that. You all now know you are at least a 35 yard shooter. You don't know how far that goes back, especially if you hit it 40. You don't know what your distance is. You gotta find a range you can get back farther than that. Okay? I just don't have it today, sorry. I couldn't get her to let me have the 100 yard range. Uh, but, but recognize, I'll bet you this morning, if I had asked you, are you good at 40 yards to shoot somebody? I would've said no. You'd've said, hell no. <laughs> Stop doubting yourself. Okay, now you're I very know. good. Now I know. Now, as a church, if you're involved in church safety at your church, there's a couple things we didn't get a, even a chance to touch on. Remember, there are only two active killer incidents at church every year in America, okay? Twice this happens a year in America, year in, year out. You might have a year of one and a year of four or whatever, but it's gonna average two every year. It's lightning strike rare. What are the more common things you know your church safety team has to deal with? You have to deal with medical emergencies, okay? You have to deal with that. And so you need to have some medical training for your team beyond boo-boo training too. They're not gonna have a major traumatic bleeding incident. They're gonna have a heart attack. They're gonna have a stroke. They're gonna have a kid with a broken arm. Okay. That's what shows up. You're gonna have a diabetic shock, somebody with a, you know, hypoglycemia, something like that. That's what's gonna show up. You need to have that training so that you know how to diagnose it, how to deal with it. So Number one. Super valuable, right? A paramedic, an EMT, a, you know, a charge nurse, any of that stuff. Uh, next thing you gotta deal with, of course, we all know that we have to prevent child sexual abuse in our church. We gotta prevent our kids being abused in our church. We gotta recognize the signs of, ch of child abuse and we have to do something about that, okay? Um, I can't recommend enough, about 70% of churches in America are insured by Brotherhood Mutual. If you're insured by Brotherhood Mutual, they have a program called Reducing the Risk that helps to minimize the chance of child sexual abuse. They will give it to you for free and they will give you an insurance discount if you use it. Why would you not do that? It's called reducing the risk. No, 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 what's the Brotherhood? Brotherhood Mutual is the insurance company that insures about 70% of churches in America, okay. okay? So chances are you're like, I don't know who's insuring my church. Chances are I do know. <laughs> it's probably Brotherhood Mutual, okay? Go ask your church family about that. It's not a hard program to instill. Basically, it's a two adult worker rule and a background check rule and a recurrent training rule. And they provide the training. Why would you not do that? Super simple. The third thing we don't talk about very much that we really need to, that your church safety team needs to absolutely be focused on, is how to prevent clergy sexual misconduct in your congregation. We don't talk about that because everybody goes, not my pastor. My pastor is a good guy. My pastor is a good person. That's how this shit happens. Yeah. Okay? We're all human and subject to temptation. Well, and abusers are kings of gaining people's trust and getting put in positions of trust. So here's your first clue. If you say, hey, pastor, we need to talk about clergy sexual misconduct and how to prevent it in our congregation, and your pastor goes, we don't have to worry about that, fire him immediately. Wow. Yeah. Probably fire him immediately, okay? Uh, and again, we must teach our congregation that number one, this is an employment violation, it is a power imbalance problem, and it is spiritual abuse, right. okay? There is no chance for a pastor in their congregation to have any romantic relationship within their congregation. Any romantic interest between a pastor and somebody in their congregation is spiritual abuse and abuse of power. Mm -hmm. And should be treated as employee misconduct and subject to termination. Just like that. Well, you don't understand, you know, their congregation, uh-uh, I did the job for 14 years. Mm -hmm. Okay? Nope. Pastor don't date in the flock. And, and if the pastor's already caught their limit, and the limit is one, okay? If you already done caught your limit, then it's off limits anyways. And if your pastor is, you know, well, they were just, it wasn't really that bad, it was just inappropriate texts. It's that bad. If he's willing to send an inappropriate text to somebody in your congregation, what is he doing that you don't know about? Okay, so, so those questions need to be asked and have hard answers to. Uh, we don't.
Because, well, no, we trust the pastor, and the pastor loves us, and, and he's the man of God, and we don't, we don't do that. That's a, a, a terrible mistake. Um, in your congregation, about 3% of women sitting in your congregation have experienced clergy sexual misconduct aimed at them. Another 6 to 7% know of it by secondhand experience, by somebody that they know has been that. So that means 10% of the women in your congregation have very close, direct experience of clergy sexual misconduct. So if you go, well, John, wait a minute. We, have, we only have 200 people in our church. That means 20 women sitting in your church are aware of this. Or, I'm sorry, 10 is the actual number. But it still means 10 human beings in your church that this affects directly, and they're just waiting for the, church, for the pastor to make a pass at them, to touch them inappropriately, to sexually abuse them. Also, we say, well, wait a minute. This is why we don't let the pastor be alone with women in our congregation. 50% of that clergy sexual misconduct is same-gendered. And you go, well, well, wait a minute, though, but John, we don't, we don't tolerate the gays in our midst. First of all, lighten up. Second of all, uh, here's the thing. Uh, anybody familiar with um, Ted Haggard? Yeah. Middle Church of Colorado? Oh. Banging on a pulpit for a, a marriage amendment in the Constitution while, within his congregation, he is paying a young man in his church for sex with methamphetamine. No. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Usually the ones that are banging on the table loudest about it are the biggest problems of it. And, and church culture has, has really played this out that says, oh, wait a minute, we need purity culture and we need women to dress moder- modestly and it's your fault. I always boggle my mind that women are, number one, totally powerless and aren't in charge of anything and shouldn't be because God says, but number two, can make a man do anything she wants simply by going, I have ankles. Yeah. <laughs> All powerful. All powerful and completely terrible. The worst Jezebel and completely gullible. All at the same time. And I'm like, these messages don't add up. I think, I think the problem's in you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? So again, these are things you got to deal with. Um, what stood out to you that you dealt with today? What stood, what stood out to you today? You can do more than you thought. Yeah. With running a, a stock standard P365 and getting hits at 40 yards? Yeah. What? Oh my God. Yeah. Somebody else, what stood out to you? Compassion, compassion for yourself. That inner critic that you've been handed is not your friend. <laughs> and I know a lot of people, oh, I know, but I just am. Um, I got two words for you, therapy. <laughs> yeah, I haven't tried that one. <laughs> <laughs> and, learning, and learning that, wait a minute, that inner critic was handed to me by somebody who didn't love me very much. And I need to overcome that and recognize I need to have compassion on me. Well, and the real problem is if you don't deal with your own inner critic, you know what happens? You pass it on to other people. You pass that inner critic on to your kids, on to your grandkids, on to your students. nieces and nephews, on to your students. Got me. Anybody else? Something stood out to you? I don't have a flinching problem. You don't flinch? You crushed it. Give her a hand. You crushed that. Listen, and, and listen, I want you to know, it's not like it's real easy for instructors to go, see, I gave you the secret sauce. I didn't give you nothing. You had it. I just reminded you that what, you already had it. I said, well, wait a minute. You don't have that. Try this thing. Oh, look at that. I did it. Yes, you did. You did really well. You solved that just like that. And now anytime you go, oh, wait a minute. I went back to my old way. Tune back into my eyes. Feel, feel as, as I do that. Sights are staying on the target while I finish my trigger press. Pfft, you own it now. And the second you can diagnose it, the second you can say, I know why that shot went there, yeah. you're now a master shooter. The second you recognize what happened in your shot process that caused your outcome, you're now a master shooter. Because you can fix that now. Once you know, 